Hey everyone, it is Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. How are you on, at least where I'm at, a slightly chilly day in the Washington DC area on this Wednesday. Um, as we always do, we're gonna kick off by just saying hello to one another. Uh, so hopefully up on the slide, you're seeing something that says two word check-in. This is an idea that we, we've borrowed from Professor Brene Brown down at the University of Houston. And so what you're gonna do, if you've been with this before, you know this, you're gonna put your name into the chat and you're gonna click that open, looks like a little word bubble. Uh, you've got to be familiar with that. Hey, Jen, you got you beat me to it. So your name, your location, and in two words, Jen and everybody else, how you doing? In two words, and I'll show you what it looks like. There we go. Cold and curious. I'm really excited for this session. Starting to see you. Ilana, Kristen, Madeline, who else? Needy, Jennifer, Dan, Aaron, Shannon, Anne, Michelle, uh, David, Gabriel. Okay, going way too fast for me. If you see folks you know, I expect you might. Please say hello to them. We're going to be chatting with one another through the course of this little hour that we have together. And just a reminder, everybody, we got 30 minutes on the other side of this hour for office hours. Vanessa has been kind enough to make herself available. So if we get to something or you have a little one to dig a little bit deeper, we'll have 30 minutes to do that afterwards. Um, name's still coming in. That's awesome. Uh, my partner in crime, Kareem Alston, is going to be running the deck for us. So Kareem, if you wouldn't mind, sir, take us along. Uh, and while you're doing that, chances are you're seeing this pinned on your screen. Our friend Marva, who, again, if you've been with us, you know she's wonderful and awesome, and she is providing ASL services for folks who might need that. Welcome to pin that if it's not already pinned for you. Grateful to have her with us. This is the thing I got to tell you about. I think we're officially a week into it now uh, that we launched Slack for everybody on the network. So those of you who have maybe been on the listserv for a while that we launched during the pandemic, um, we're moving things slowly but surely over to Slack. Uh, and been delighted to see literally hundreds upon hundreds of folks joining in. Uh, and this is something we think is only going to become more valuable over time. Many of you may be already using Slack at work. This is a great way to kind of just be able to knock on the door and ask all of us on those days where maybe you have a question or you want to share something or you're looking for a resource. This is, uh, we hope, going to be a tremendous tool, but it will obviously benefit from your uh, good attention and participation. Um, but we're hoping that it's uh, it's off to a good start. We're, we're excited to have everybody there. All right, let's move along. How to get to Slack, by the way, you've gotten emails from us, but if you just go to the brand new, Kareem built this as well, comnetwork.org, you'll see that little logo of Slack there on the homepage. Click on that. And if you're a member, it should take you right in. If there's any issues, Kareem, if you don't mind sticking your email into the chat here, and we're going to put a bunch of stuff in the chat over the course of the next little while, but Kareem will put his email in there. If you've got questions and you're a member, this is important to mention, Slack's only for network members, but if you're a member, he'll help you if you have uh, any issues getting in or getting sorted there. All right, let's move it along. We hope to see you over there. In fact, we're going to take a bunch of resources here and put them into Slack afterwards. Uh, are we doing this one? Okay, so I expect many of you know this. In fact, a lot of folks in Slack have been talking about it. They'll see us in Atlanta. That's great because we're going to be in Atlanta September 20th through 23rd. And one of the things we want to know is we're going to be making a call for proposals very, very shortly. But in the meantime... And JD, yes, Slack will replace the email list serve. We'll retire that in the next couple of months, but we're going to let it run for the next little while just now. Um, but we would love to hear from you, get your input as we're planning for Atlanta. So there's a little uh, link in there. Uh, you can check it out, but we're also wanting to see the survey. If you go ahead and, uh, and take the survey at some point, we'd be grateful because we want to make sure what we're building makes sense and works for you and, and is valuable. All right, moving right along. Next slide, circles, chances are you know what these are. And if you are a circle member, you know you've been on Slack for a while. So the idea here is pretty simple. It's the network within the network. It's a chance to find people based on the job that you do, the uh, issues that you're working on, or maybe an identity that you share with your colleagues in the network. Um, we've been had these now for about a year and a half, and we've just been astonished by how much uh, uh, momentum and energy there is around this. It's really delightful to see everybody helping each other out. Um, Suffice to say, if you're a network member, you're welcome to take a joint to, to take a go at these. And we're going to be adding a few in the next couple of months. So stay tuned. If you don't see something that works for you, give us a just a couple of minutes. Chances are uh, we're going to be adding some before too long. All right, moving right along. Mr. K. Locals. This is the other thing. Hopefully you know this. And chances are, if you're good at geography, you can pick out all the cities with these little dots here, little markers. Um, we've got two locals that are meeting in the next couple of days. Uh, our friends in New York City are going to be gathering in real life today. Check that out on comnetwork.org. If you go to the locals page and click on New York, you can get all the information. These are free and open to anybody. The idea is to build community in the places where we all work and live. Because um, you know what? Borrowing a cup of sugar from someone who lives a thousand miles away is not always the most efficient or effective thing to do. So getting to know your neighbors is a good thing. And that's what locals are all about. Again, New York today. And then Kareem, if you'll take us forward, our friends in Detroit, we're supposed to gather apparently 
perhaps no surprise to anybody in the upper Midwest, they're getting snow today, middle of January. So they've moved these back to February the 9th uh, to make sure everybody stays safe. So we will see you then and there. Uh, and Kareem or Tristan rather is putting things into the into the chat. So if you want to avail yourself of that, go to Detroit, click there, and you'll be welcome to, to join up with those folks. It's free and open to all. All right, moving right along. We are here now. Uh, Vanessa has been kind enough. Chances are many of you may have seen her in Seattle. She did a presentation on evaluation. It was so popular. We thought we'd invite her back. So Vanessa Schneit uh, is going to talk to us about that thing that oftentimes is kind of a sticky wicket for all of us. And that is, all right, we're doing really great work, but how do we know if it's working? How do we know if we're being effective? And how do we tell the bosses, look at all these great outcomes that we've gotten to, um, as opposed to outputs maybe we've produced. So Vanessa's going to take us through that for the next little while. I'm going to shut up and I will see you on the other side at office hours. Vanessa, my friend, over to you and grateful that you are happy and safe and well uh, after a few tough weeks for everybody out there in California. I know you had the rains and then more recently, some of the violence that's been occurring uh, in, your, in your community. So we're all thinking about you and grateful to have your time today. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sean. And hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you all today to talk about measuring communication success. Um, as communicators, I know you're wearing 14 hats, guiding at least eight initiatives, and managing a never-ending to-do list. So thank you for taking time today to be here and learn together. And a big thank you to Marva for providing our ASL services today. Um, I also want to acknowledge that many of us, particularly our friends, family and colleagues in the AAPI community are grieving after multiple mass shootings this past week. And so we stand with you and beside you. My name is Vanessa Schneit. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm part of the team at Cause Communications, the only nonprofit of its kind dedicated to communications effectiveness. I've been a member of the communications network for 14 years now, and I have to say the sense of connection and insights that I've gotten from this community uh, has been really invaluable. And so my goal today is to give back that same value on a topic near and dear to my heart, measuring your communications. So the goals for today are threefold. One, help you lay a strategic foundation for your evaluation work. Two, break down the why what, how, and when of measurement, and three, offer up some specific tips and considerations that will help you bring these concepts back to your organization, no matter if you already have a robust measurement practice in place or if you're just getting started. Now, implicit in these goals is something worth declaring here at the outset, that yes, you can measure your communications work. It is not always linear, but it is possible. In fact, let's take a moment to see who here is already engaged in monitoring and evaluation. We're going to put up a poll question here and I invite you to share, when was the last time you sat down and evaluated the impact of your communications? Wherever you are today, that's okay. And so while you're chiming in here, let me be clear about what this webinar is and what it isn't. We will not be covering UTMs and the mechanics of setting up dashboards. We will be taking a strategic, holistic look at the different parts of communications evaluation with a bias towards lots of practical takeaways. All right, let's bring up those poll results so you can see them. All right, awesome. Oh, wow. All right, so it looks like we've got, you know, about a third um, who have been very actively engaged in some type of assessment, another third that's been engaged in monitoring and evaluation in the last you know, six months, that's amazing. Good news for all of you, we will be covering ways to ensure your evaluation work is as strategic and focused as possible. And I see that we've got you know, some folks where this just isn't a regular thing or even a current reality that's okay, you're in the right place. Uh, we'll talk about how to build up that muscle. Even more specifically, um, here's what you can expect for the next 45 minutes or so. I'll start by introducing some ways that we can all keep the learning going after this webinar today. We'll spend a few minutes talking about why even measure in the first place, focusing on two key benefits of evaluating your communications activities. Next, we'll dig into the building blocks of where to start, and I'll introduce four principles that you can use to set yourself up for success. Then we'll cover uh, what to measure and how to choose the right metrics for your organization. 
Here's where we'll break down things like outputs versus outcomes and qualitative versus quantitative metrics. That will move us into the when and how of measurement. And I'll share some tips for proactively creating a cycle of learning, as well as some ways to build monitoring and evaluation into the work that you're already doing. Lastly, I'll share two quick case studies that help bring these concepts all together. So that's the game plan for the content that I'll be covering, and then we'll move into the office hours portion for Q&A and discussion. Sound good? Okay, let's get to it. Now, as communicators, we're not just birds of a feather here today. We are a community of experts and practitioners. So I want to take a moment to acknowledge and really honor the wisdom here in this virtual room today. This topic is big and complex and there are no one size fits all solutions here. So as questions arise in the chat, chime in if you have an answer or a related resource to share. Particularly those folks who have done some evaluation in the last six months, your experiences and insights are super valuable to this community. Beyond the chat, there are two other ways that we can keep this learning going and continue to support each other that I want to call out. The first is a public facing collaborative doc open to anyone where we can share resources and tools for evaluation. Now, if you're familiar with the communications network, then I'm sure you've seen uh, the previous collaborative docs that Shauna and his team have spearheaded. So I'm excited that we get to add to that collection and growing body of knowledge. Uh, Kareem has already dropped a link uh, to that here in the chat. Thanks, Kareem. And you'll see that it's already populated with all of the resources I'll be mentioning here today, plus a ton more that I won't have a chance to call out specifically that will be great to explore later. And beyond the resources that I'm lifting up, we can also use this doc to crowdsource additional tools and articles. So if your organization has produced something or you've used something that would be helpful for others, drop it into the doc. Second, we're going to use the resources channel on Com Network's new members only Slack platform to share examples of communications impact reports, sample dashboards, case studies, really specific stuff. So again, I invite you to share those with your fellow community members. Okay, first things first, what is the point? Why measure our communications activities in the first place? Well, to answer that question, I'm going to tell a quick story that I like to call how I learned to love reporting. Why measure? Well, if I'm directing that question to early career me, my answer would be simple, because my supervisor told me to. There were board reports and annual reports and campaign reports, and I collected the data and I wrote a narrative about it, but I dreaded it. It was boring and it was tedious and it felt disconnected from my day-to-day -day work. Can any of you relate? I'm gonna go on, on a limb here and guess that there are some heads nodding out there. I would also venture to guess that one reason measurement either doesn't happen or gets done only begrudgingly is because we already have so much on our plates. Why should I carve out time for yet another thing on my to-do list when there are so many competing priorities to begin with? So it really wasn't until my first role as a communications director of a large nonprofit that my perspective changed. Now, I truly am in this field because I want to make a difference in the world, but I have to be honest with you. I learned to love reporting once I figured out what's in it for me. And what's in it for me is what's in it for you. So let's zero in on two main purposes or benefits of evaluating your communications. The first is to tell the story of your impact. For our external stakeholders, this means the impact of the organization or the impact that a particular campaign is having. And this became exciting when I realized that the story we were telling could help secure funding for the next year of the campaign. It could deepen the trust and collaboration among our partners because these were stories and outcomes that they could take pride in too. And by showcasing the work and the impacts of projects that bring our mission to life, we were naturally attracting more people who shared our vision and our values. Now for our internal stakeholders, this was an opportunity to make the case for communications. Reports and data became tools for transparency and education, tools to really shine a light on this field of communications that can, let's face it, sometimes be a little enigmatic to folks who are not doing this work day in and day out. Additionally, showing the value of the investment in communications can strengthen your case to secure more staff and a larger budget. So think of it this way. 
If I can show we're moving in the right direction towards our goals, then I've got a greater chance of folks rallying behind the strategy and understanding that a mighty team of one, for example, is not sustainable if we want to reach that goal. The second big uh, benefit of evaluation is to set future strategy. Metrics and reporting give you a clearer understanding of what's working and what's not. And with that information, it's easier to identify new opportunities and directions for experimentation. It can spark ideas for what to try or test out next. So speaking of experimentation, Candid just published a great blog post about a three month experiment that they conducted with short form video. It's a super example of using communications evaluation to tell the story of your impact and gather new insights that inform future strategy. So down to each specific activity, whether that's short form video or a press conference, you can start to see what's happening and then figure out the strongest mix of tactics moving forward. You can look at each tactic and evaluate, is this something we want to keep, adjust, or stop? Yes, stop. That's right, with this information, you're also better equipped to make decisions about what to pause or stop doing, things that you can say no to. I know, I know, that's a very novel idea in our world, right? But how cool is that? A tool for figuring out what to take off of your plate. For example, can you stop uh, investing in thrice weekly posts on a particular social media channel, knowing that your target audience prefers to hang out on a different platform? Um, and I'll just note uh, for, for Anna and others who are, are curious, the case study that I just mentioned uh, that's published in the Candid blog post, that link is also included in the collaborative doc uh, that Kareem shared the, the link to. So that's all right there for you. Um, you can also think about you know, if sending a press release out on the wire is only getting you pickups in obscure outlets that you've never heard of and not the publications that you know your audience pays attention to, well, then that's an opportunity to stop the wires, rethink your earned media strategy, right? And reinvest those hundreds of dollars in a different communications activity that will actually get your messages in front of the right audiences. In this process, you can also get a better understanding of what it takes to get the results that you want and whether or not you have enough resources and really the right resources, both in terms of people power and budget. JD, thank you for lifting up uh, this really cool reminder um, in thinking about you know, what can you keep, improve, start, and stop. What a great way of, of thinking about that as we're evaluating our own uh, activities. Thanks so much for dropping that in. So you can see how reframing evaluation in this way turned out to be pretty helpful. Once these benefits became clear to me, I realized that carving out time for monitoring and evaluation today is really a gift to my future self and to the success of the organization. All right, so where does this gift giving begin? <laughs> now that we've answered the why question, how do we actually get started? How do we set ourselves up for success? Well, for the next few minutes, I'm going to introduce four anchors that will help you lay the foundation for all of your measurement and metrics. Understanding the impact of your communications all starts with defining and understanding what success looks like. That's number one. At the broadest level, we're talking about what are your organizational goals? Not just what do you want to accomplish as a communicator or within the communications department, but what is the organization as a whole trying to achieve? What is your priority for this next year? Or thinking even longer term, what kind of change are you seeking to affect over time? In many organizations, you'll have access to resources and information that already define this. That could look like an organizational strategic plan or a logic model. But even in the absence of an up-to-date strategy, you can look to your organization's mission, your vision, your purpose, or you can set up meetings with senior leadership or department heads and have a conversation with them about what you're trying to do in the short and long term. The point is that these organizational goals can serve as our North Star. This is what everything points to. But why is this so important? Well, because this is how we identify and prioritize our communications objectives, our strategies, our tactics. And then ultimately, we'll want to connect our measurement and evaluation efforts back to this as well. So let's think about a few examples here. That organizational goal might look like 
a foundation that wants to commemorate its 25th anniversary by launching two new grant making priorities. Thinking about internal goals, maybe your organization wants to strengthen a sense of connection among staff as you embark on your first full year of a new hybrid work model. Or perhaps an environmental nonprofit wants to protect an urban wetlands area that's slated for development next year. Quick sidebar here, having a North Star that's bigger than just our communications department is also really helpful for the day-to-day -day realities of how our work gets done. We all know that communications does not happen in a vacuum. We work with colleagues in every other department. And not only are they our collaborators and our partners in this work, but they are also often our internal clients, if you will, folks who want or need something from us. And so when we can point to a broader goal, a shared goal that is bigger than any one department, we can approach everything from the position of being on the same team. And that's super powerful. Next, be clear about who are your audiences, prioritize them, develop personas for them. For many of you, this is already part of your communications planning process. If that's the case, awesome, you're ahead of the game. For those who haven't had the opportunity to reflect on this recently, I invite you to carve out some time to understand who do you need to reach and engage in order to achieve your organizational goals. Now, another way of framing this besides who do you need to reach could be who can help us achieve this goal? Or even where are the levers of power? Who has the ability to make decisions? And who's in a position to influence these decision makers? Clearly articulating your audiences now will set you up down the road for being able to assess if your communications efforts are on track and making a difference. Because the assessment is really making a difference among whom, right? Next, you'll wanna identify one or more communications objectives. How can communications contribute to and really accelerate progress towards that broader organizational goal? Well, first let's consider what's even possible. What can communications achieve? Now, we all see firsthand every day the incredible power of communications and how it's all connected to every other part of our organization. As Causes founder Chris Hershey often says, communications is everything. It leads to bigger fundraising dollars, better stories, healthier communities. But from an evaluation standpoint, what can we actually hold communications accountable for? And what's even measurable? Well, communications can raise awareness and understanding. It can influence or change attitudes and beliefs, and it can compel people to act, what we call engagement. So going back to our North Star, in order to achieve our organizational goal, which of these do we need to do? Raise awareness, change attitudes, motivate people to take action. Sometimes for longer or loftier goals, we'll actually need to do all three, in which case, it's helpful to think of these three A's, not just as a list, but as a continuum of outcomes. Going back to our audiences for a moment, the more we know about where they currently stand in relation to our organizational goal, the easier it will be to identify what step we need them to take next, or how we want to use the strategic power of communications to move them along that continuum. Let's connect this back to the, our example of the environmental nonprofit that wants to protect some local wetlands from development. We might decide to focus on residents who live in the area around these wetlands, right? So that's our audience. And then use communications to raise awareness about the scope of this issue. Why is it a bad idea for these wetlands to be developed? We can influence attitudes among residents and encourage them to care about protecting these wetlands. And we can give them clear action steps so they can get involved in the advocacy that will prevent the development from happening, right? So that's the power of communications. That's what's possible. The last anchor I wanna highlight is about planning and timing. A question I'll often hear is, when is the ideal time for the measurement and evaluation process to begin? Well, the answer is now and early. <laughs> evaluation is not something to start thinking about at the end of a project or campaign. What we want to do instead is build monitoring, evaluation, and learning into the entire process. And that starts with building it into the communications planning process. Yes, I said it, communications plan. Uh, well, look, I know it's every, it's really anyone's guess at this point what the world is going to look like even six months from now, 
I'm still a huge proponent of developing a strategy and sitting down to write a communications plan. Chances are planning is the topic of conversation going on right now in your organization, whether you're looking at 2023 as a whole, your plans for this quarter, or if you're getting ready to launch a specific new campaign. So I think it's awesome timing that we're all here together today. Even if you only do a one page plan or an outline, that strategy doc is the perfect place to connect your communications activities or tactics to the measurement and, and evaluation piece. Include a section in your communications plan dedicated to this. I know it sounds obvious, but it's a great way to keep yourself accountable and build in opportunities to be strategic and proactive. Because goodness knows on the day to day, it's hard to really build in time for that. And granted, each communications plan I develop uh, looks a little different, but I find it's helpful to start from the same basic outline each time. And in that outline, I have a placeholder, as you can see from this graphic, for measurement and evaluation. If this chart on the slide is helpful to you, we have a handout version of the plan outline that we'll drop into the, the chat here. So we'll share that link with you now. Uh, so that measurement section of the plan is an opportunity to reflect on the questions that we've already been talking about. How, what does the success look like? Um, what information do we need to know if, if we are going to be able to tell if we're on track to reach those goals? How will we monitor and measure if we're affecting awareness, attitudes, and actions? So then to recap, those four principles to anchor your communications evaluation are, define what success looks like, look to your goals as your organizations, or excuse me, look to your organizational goals as your North Star, be clear about who you want to reach, set communications objectives, and map out the approach in your communications plan. These are the steps that are going to help ensure that the valuable time you dedicate to measurement and evaluation will be worth it. Okay, so with answers to these questions, what does success look like? Who do we need to engage to achieve that success? We're ready to figure out what are the indicators or results that tell us that we're on the right track. That brings us, what, that brings us to what to measure. Now, in the age of digital media and sophisticated software platforms, I don't know about you, but oftentimes for me, it feels like there's such an overwhelming amount of data out there that is available to us. And it's true, you know, we could go down a rabbit hole after rabbit hole, Google Analytics, social media metrics, media monitoring dashboards, and countless other tools that are at our disposal right now. And without those anchors, it's easy to see how reporting can feel like an exhausting and really futile exercise. Here's the good news. We can't and don't need to boil the ocean here, guys. We don't need all the metrics. We need the right metrics. And so next I'm going to go over four different types of metrics you can choose from and tips for how to apply each of them in your own measurement work. Those four are, outputs versus outcomes, quantitative versus qualitative, context versus comparison, and about versus from. We'll take them one at a time. Okay, let's start with our familiar but sometimes confusing friends, outputs and outcomes. The key takeaway here is that both have a place in measuring communications. Now, is it just me or does the tone that people use when talking about outputs sometimes sound a little more like a Voldemort, he who should not be named sort of thing. You know, outputs sometimes get a bad rap, but don't count them out. Because on the flip side, just focusing on outcomes doesn't tell the whole story either. It's about the relationship between the two and how they work together. So let's break that down. What are they? Outputs are the activities you carry out. It's a reflection of what happened. Outcomes are the value you've created. It's a reflection of your effectiveness or the level of achievement. What are you measuring? Well, for outputs, you're measuring the actions that you've taken towards a goal. For outcomes, you're measuring the difference made by the outputs. Think of the outputs as the what and the outcomes as the so what. It's action versus impact. Outputs are often quantifiable and therefore easier to track or measure. And outcomes can be quantitative or qualitative. And because they're often less tangible, sometimes they can be harder to track or they just take a little bit more creativity on, on our part. 
But I find it, it's helpful to think about the, the outputs as the more flexible of the two. If you determine that you're not on track to reach your objective, you may switch gears and focus on different outputs. Another way to think about the difference between outputs and outcomes, and also the relationship between them, is to consider the level of control involved in each of them. You can directly influence outputs. And when you deliver the right outputs, you can influence, at least indirectly, what your outcomes are. You need both to achieve your objectives. So let's put an even finer point on it and go back to that V word. No, not Voldemort. I'm talking about vanity metrics. So what about things like impressions or reach, so-called vanity metrics that people often refer to? Do these have value? Is there any context in which we should be tracking and sharing them? Well, I'd say it, it depends. And it depends on those foundational pieces that we defined earlier. What is your organizational goal? Who are you trying to influence? And what is your communications objective? If your objective is to increase awareness of this local wetlands issue among nearby residents, then reach or impressions in a community newspaper read by your target audience would be a great metric to track. If your press release generates huge reach numbers, but the publications aren't even in the right county, then no, it's not in the service of your larger goals. But here's the thing. Even if metrics like reach make sense in the context of your specific objectives, what's even more powerful is the combination of metrics that demonstrate movement along that continuum. For example, what was the tone or the sentiment in the article published in that local paper? Did your key messages come through clearly in that story? Did the spokesperson who was quoted give residents a reason to care about protecting those wetlands, right? So that really brings some of those other measurements to life and tells a, a much richer story. It's that constellation of metrics that will tell a more complete and accurate picture of how and why your communications efforts made a difference. I'm seeing some really great comments here in the, the chat. I just want to pause here and acknowledge that, uh, first of all, thanks so much for sharing ideas and resources and for uh, tapping into Slack for additional resources as well. I'm also seeing some really important um, references lifted up around DEI. We'll be touching on that in just a few minutes as well. So uh, hang tight. Um, we'll definitely get to that too. Oh, the second type of metrics to consider in your evaluation plan is quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative data are expressed as numbers and reflect things like how many, how much, or how often. Some common types of quantitative data in our universe uh, as communicators would include things like email open rates, event attendance, number of media articles published, dollars raised, or number of grantee stories published. Qualitative data reflect how people think or respond and allow you to explore concepts and experiences in more detail. So examples of qualitative data include how someone felt at an event, the tone of a media article, key messages or themes embedded in an influencer's social media post or feedback from that grantee. You can gather qualitative data with open-ended surveys, one-on-one -on -one interviews, focus groups, case study research, participant testimonials, and other first-person narratives. In our wetlands example, I might conduct focus groups at a few key milestones in our campaign, or I could have conversations with community members as they're leaving a neighborhood council meeting, right? Both great approaches. The third type of metrics to consider is context versus comparison. I love annual surveys and reports with tons of data about other organizations, but I would encourage you to be really intentional about how you're using industry averages or third-party data. This big grain of salt also applies to those benchmarks embedded in the reporting tools on your favorite email service provider or social media platform. Those data are awesome as context, but it can get a little tricky when you try to use those as the litmus test for whether or not your email campaign was successful. Because when it comes to other organizations' data or those aggregate numbers, we often don't see behind the scenes of what other organizations did to achieve those outcomes. We don't know if they had a team of two or a team of 12. We don't know what kind of budget they had. We don't know if internal buy-in was an uphill battle. 
What we do know is our own organization. That's why one of the most powerful things you can track is your change or progress over time, right? Wilson and Tori are lifting this up in, in the chat right now. Uh, this gives you a solid baseline for comparison when you're using your own data as baselines and benchmarks. It gives you a basis for comparison and not just context, right? You can see what happened last time, what's happening now. And that distinction between context versus comparison is an important one and one that you know, when we're faced with so many, you know, industry averages, I, you know, I hope can feel a little bit freeing uh, for us as well. Just as with our first two categories of metrics, this isn't an either or proposition. It's about knowing when it's strategic and helpful to use each. Uh, here are a few places where you can find some incredibly valuable context for your own data. Again, you'll find links to all these resources in our collaborative doc. Lastly, let's touch on some equity considerations and how we can thoughtfully approach when we're using data about people versus data from people. Now, ongoing efforts around ethical storytelling, asset framing, DEI, themes that are familiar to many of us who are part of the communications network. Well, these themes are also relevant and important in the context of communications data and evaluation. As communicators, there is power and privilege in the decisions that we make about what metrics to track and what data we're using to tell our stories of impact or set future strategy. When we think of voices as data, it's critical that we be mindful of whose experiences we are centering. What assumptions might we be making about the audiences whose awareness, attitudes, and actions we're measuring? Are we even asking the right questions? Do the categories embedded in the data dashboards of soft software platforms align with how the communities that we're serving would choose to define themselves? Now, I'm not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater here, but I am advocating for a level of intentionality, for co-creation wherever possible, and seeking out opportunities to include more data from and not just data about. This intentionality starts with reflection. I've listed a few prompts here on the slide to keep in mind as you're building your evaluation practice. And this extends to the final product as well, the stories and the reports that you create about your impact. One simple test that I just love uh, that my colleague Krista Wilson introduced me to is something called the face-to-face -face test. Now, if you wrote up a case study or other externally facing account of your organization's communications impact, would the audiences that you're referencing in that report be proud of the story that you're telling? What would their reaction be if you were standing face to face with them? These are important opportunities that, um, to consider as we commit to a communications practice that centers the dignity and humanity of the communities that we serve. So briefly, here again are these four categories of metrics. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but hopefully it offers some helpful frameworks as you're determining what are the most relevant metrics to track and evaluate in your, in your communications work. You can draw from each of these four categories when you're thinking about the strongest ways to measure how your communications is shifting awareness, attitudes, and actions. And here are just a few examples of the types of indicators that you can use to track progress towards those three communications results. Now, I know there's a lot of content on this slide, but as you're skimming the three lists, I hope one thing that shines through is that most, if not all of these metrics are possible to track in-house. Are there instances where a third party evaluator is a strategic and worthwhile use of budget dollars? Sure, absolutely but you don't need to bring in an outside evaluator to assess your communications. And you don't need to have the word evaluation in your title to be a good evaluator. There's so much that you can do and do well. Let's pause for a second. Depending on the organization and where you are in your evaluation journey, what we've discussed can still feel like a lot. I want to acknowledge that. So in addition to the tips that I've shared, allow me to offer three additional reassurances. Number one, small victories count. Not every metric has to be world-changing to be meaningful. You want to identify different milestones or markers of progress depending on where you are in the process. 
If your public outreach campaign is designed to help pass a piece of policy, well, then certainly that outcome is going to be one key measure of success. But if there are foundational pieces that you're getting off the ground, like establishing a presence on a new social media platform or creating campaign materials in four different languages, then those are milestones worth noting and celebrating and linking back to your communications objective and broader goals. This aligns with a really important reminder that Jenny Field offered in her webinar on internal communications last year that's relevant to lift up here. It's something she called linking measurement to the maturity of the function. In short, what we're talking about is right-sizing the metrics to not just the overall goals, but to where your organization is. Number two, process can also be powerful. Don't overlook these quote unquote softer successes. It's not just about metrics. The story of your impact can also be told by lifting up how the work was done. The process matters too. For example, maybe this was the first time that you had four departments well coordinated in their efforts and speaking from the same messaging playbook. That's huge. At least when it comes to internal reports, I'd say that's a story worth telling. And number three, to borrow a phrase from the communications network, you don't have to go it alone. There's going to be some data that only you and your colleagues in communications have access to and can track, but also consider what can your colleagues track or provide that paints a clearer, fuller picture of what's happening? How can you enlist support from colleagues in other departments so that the right data is coming your way? Okay, let's keep it super practical and talk about when and how to measure. And within that, we'll break it down into the stuff that we wanna proactively pursue and set up, and then also some tools and examples of more passive tactics so data collection is happening on an ongoing basis. But just so that we don't get jumbled up, let's take a moment to define a couple of terms. Monitoring is ongoing data collection, evaluation, is what you do with all the data that you get from your monitoring. It's the assessment that you make based on your data. And so both are key parts of determining if your communications efforts are successful. Let's revisit that question I hear a lot from fellow nonprofits and foundations. When and how often do I measure? As with all learning and evaluation, we want to think of measuring the impact of our communications as a cyclical process, not something with a finite start and end date. As you can see, we go from the strategy-driven planning to the monitoring or data collection. Then we figure out what all that data means and then use those insights to inform and strengthen the next set of plans. Now, even within a very specific communications campaign, you can situate that in the broader context of past and future campaigns so that your key learnings from this project inform the next and your next effort is stronger. So it works there too. And let's take a closer look at this monitoring piece. What does that look like? How often are we proactively gathering data? Well, in part, that will depend on how and when you're going to evaluate it and then communicate about it with your stakeholders. In other words, the cadence could be tied to organizational milestones like board meetings or annual reports, or it might be tied to milestones that are specific to your communication strategy and how often you need those insights to tell what's working and if you need to adjust mid-course. Okay, so quick reality check. Um, this is obviously a lovely aspirational state and perhaps what's happening in many of your organizations. But what if you have clear goals, but the specific data isn't available to you? What if there are gaps in what you're able to monitor currently? Well, in the immediate term, I would focus on what data do you have available right now and how might that serve as at least an indicator that you're moving in the right direction? What might you even re retroactively go back and, and collect? And then I'd also start gathering more and new data now or from this point forward so that you do have it next time. If it's a bandwidth issue, then this is an opportunity to get really specific about prioritizing what three to five metrics will tell the clearest, most direct story about progress towards that objective. And quite frankly, this could also be an opportunity to shift how and what you're measuring so that you do have access to the information and the insights that you need. Now, in addition to, uh, to the data polling and the evaluation that you're actively engaged in, 
consider ways to integrate monitoring into what you're already doing, right? We don't need another thing on that to-do list. Embed it in the touch points that you've already established with your audiences so that the data collection is happening in the background on an ongoing basis. There are so many opportunities everywhere in the communications infrastructure that you've already built to better understand who your audiences are, what they're doing, and how effective you are at reaching them. Here are just a few examples that I've listed on this slide. That includes gated reports that require maybe an organization name or title or issue area to be able to, to access it. Social media polls, maybe you know, integrate one into uh, your editorial calendar every month. Newsletter signups, you can integrate a question about how did you hear about us? And then one example that I recently came across and just love uh, from our friends over at the MacArthur Foundation, you know, have a, a survey pop up um, on your website as folks are, are experiencing um, the different content or different sections of content on your site, right? Think of these as the passive income of the measurement world. And that's just a starter list, right? I bet this is an area where folks here on this webinar have found some pretty cool ways to integrate data gathering and monitoring into your day to day. So if you have something to share, drop it in the chat. I would love to see those ideas and examples. Okay, phew, we are in the home stretch, everyone. In the time that we have left, I'm going to share two quick case studies to demonstrate some of these concepts in action. And then for those who want to continue the conversation, we'll move into the office hours portion for more discussion and Q&A. In this first case study, I want to share a very literal but ultimately effective way to connect your communications metrics back to your organization's broader strategic plan. At the nonprofit that's the focus of this story, we had just unveiled a new 10-year strategic plan. As an organization that was used to operating in more of a background kind of supporting role, this plan represented a very intentional shift towards being an even more effective and let's say extroverted organization. We wanted more partnerships, increased trust, and a bigger footprint of who our programs were helping. So at the communications level, that meant our objectives were focused on greater visibility for the organization and greater understanding of what we do and how we can help. We wanted to clarify and strengthen what the organization was known for and why that mattered. And so this new strategic plan turned out to be not only our North Star, but also a tool for getting there. Okay, so what did that look like? Not only did we use keywords and core messages about that strategic vision repeatedly in public facing materials, we mentioned the plan itself. This was not just an internal document. In fact, it became standard practice for more than a year to include a paragraph in every single press release that explained how this news or announcement connected back to a particular pillar of that strategic plan. We called it out. We thought about what narrative do we want to set up? What is the story that we want others to start telling about us? And then we literally wrote the story into our press releases and newsletter blurbs and handed it to our audiences. And so what did that mean for our measurement and evaluation? Well, for the metrics that we tracked and the analysis that we included in our quarterly board reports, we focused on things like what was the message pull through in what others wrote about uh, the organization? Did these keywords and themes from the strategic plan come through? We literally coded media mentions by each of the strategic plan's different pillars. And with that, we were then able to monitor and see with that quantitative data and qualitative data where we were increasing mindshare among our audiences. And I had a clear picture of proportionally which aspects of our organization's vision needed a little extra oomph or visibility in this next quarter. I had data that helped me make decisions about where my team's time should be spent. We also gathered data from other departments and paid attention to what types of inquiries were coming in. What types of partnerships were other organizations pursuing with us, right? That helped us to see on what topics or types of projects were we becoming the go-to organization? What were we known for and for what were we being trusted? So here we have a case study, again, of using our strategic plan as the North Star, 
getting quantitative and qualitative data that helped us demonstrate impact to our stakeholders and make decisions about future communications activities. The second case study is for a collaborative community-centered initiative called We Rise. Now, Cause Communications has had the privilege of shepherding this initiative for the past five years. And our overarching goal for We Rise, our North Star, if you will, is to strengthen mental well being and healing across Los Angeles County. And our primary audience was LA County youth and young adults. In 2022, we worked with 26 community based organizations and six Los Angeles County departments who then designed, developed, and hosted culturally relevant events and programs for their local communities. Now, these partners were the true stars of We Rise, these incredible community-based nonprofits and leaders who put, up, who put up more than 200 events and programs during Mental Health Awareness Month. But we also know that there were areas where communications and outreach could make an Im impact. So we tracked those efforts to find out. Our communications objectives for We Rise last year focused on three things. The first was amplifying our partners and promoting their events. The second was connecting county residents to mental health resources. And the third was shifting perceptions about mental health and well being. To do that, our communications and outreach activities included things like earn media, a digital media campaign that included collaborations with community members who represented our target audience paid media, and equipping our partners with the tools to help set them up for success. Monitoring data um, monitoring and data gathering in this case took place regularly throughout the whole initiative so that we could adapt along the way. That was really important to us. Even though it was only a month long uh, initiative, we knew there were ways that we could iterate within those four weeks. And so metrics that we followed included um, not just media coverage, but what language that coverage took place in. Website traffic and especially activity on our resources page, since that was one of our communications goals. Event attendance we also looked at and engagement with social media content. And while we tracked the majority of our metrics in house, we also partnered with an outside evaluator um, given the scope of this initiative. And so from that evaluator, we learned uh, that one in three county youth ages 14 to 25 and one in six adults were exposed to some aspect of We Rise. We Rise reached most major racial or ethnic groups in the county. And we learned that perceptions of the events were very positive, with the vast majority saying that the event that they attended connected them with resources and community showed some of the strengths of their community, empowered them to take care of their well-being, and showed the healing power of creative expression. We also found that residents exposed to the campaign were more likely to feel mobilized around mental health issues. Uh, and we were able to uh, learn about this from broader surveys, as well as uh, interviews and surveys that took place at the events themselves. One of the other outcomes that we saw was a deepening sense of connection among the participating partner organizations, a qualitative but really important result uh, from those efforts. Now, one of the ideas that I mentioned earlier was that telling the story of your communications efforts isn't just about the numbers, it's also about the process. Well, we, we Rise offers a really great example of that very concept. As I said, a lot of our focus was on amplifying the strength of our partners and setting them up for success. And one of the things that we did was create a digital toolkit for them with pre-drafted social media content and graphics. By focusing really intently on who comprised uh, these community audiences uh, all across LA County, we determined that it was imperative for us to offer that toolkit content in seven different languages. So we used a trusted translation service to help us with that. Um, but because we had made a commitment to be community-centered, we built into the process sharing these translations 
with the community representatives to make sure that the content was not only accurate and the key campaign themes uh, were coming through clearly, but that the translations were culturally relevant and reflected the nuances of how someone from these communities might actually talk about mental health. So although that took longer, the process was worth it for us, not just because we saw in the numbers just how many partners downloaded and used the content from that toolkit and how many audience members clicked on those posts to learn more and get connected to those resources, but also because it aligned with the initiative's values. So that's something that made it into our internal reports. Now, externally, quite often it's up to us in the communications department to make a program uh, or initiative um, and tell the story of what happened and why that mattered. So if you're curious about how we chose to encapsulate this initiative and the quantitative and qualitative value that it had here in LA County, we'll, we'll drop that link uh, to our highlight video into the chat as well. And yes, I'm seeing some great affirmations in the, the, the chat here about that community review process um, and a big plus one on compensating those uh, community members for their efforts and time and expertise as well. We certainly did that. Okay, so moving forward, I hope the concepts that we've discussed and the tips that I've shared here this afternoon or this morning uh, prove to be valuable to you as you continue to develop your roadmap for measuring communication success. It is possible, you can do it. And remember these three things. One, keep it connected. Your organizational goals, key audiences and communications objectives are your anchors that keep everything else focused. Two, be intentional. We don't have time for this throwing spaghetti on the wall approach, right? We've got too much other stuff to do. Focus on the right metrics and let the rest go. And three, keep the learning going. Remember, we have the resources channel on Slack and the collaborative doc, so we can continue to share and benefit from the wisdom and experience of this amazing communications network community. And so with that, I will pass it back over to Sean, who will recap just how to join us if you want to keep that conversation going. All right, I get to invite you all to a party. That's great. Vanessa, that was wonderful. I can't think of a better start to our 2023 webinar sessions. Huge congrats to you and to everyone on the team over there cause. Great work. Also grateful to Kareem and Tristan and, of course, Mar uh, Marva for helping us out. Um, if you have time, we would love to welcome you. Uh, hang out with us over in office hours. Kareem's about to toss that into the chat. Uh, and so you'll see that in just a quick minute. We'll leave this gate open or this Zoom open so you can find that. And you, Kareem just tossed that in, I believe. Uh, and you should be able to find that. Go ahead. I'm going to head over there now. I will see you there, but we'll leave this open so you can get this link. It's another Zoom session. You'll close this one out. Head over there, and Vanessa and I will be available for the next 30 minutes or so to take your questions. We're going to do it uh, as we always do. First come, first serve. First person with a question, you get to go first. So we'll see you there. Vanessa, I'll see you there in just a quick minute. Thanks, everybody. Be safe and well. See you.